So Andre gave us a nice introduction to Antarctic tephra chronology this morning, and I am going to talk this afternoon about a slightly different aspect of Antarctic tephra chronology, really focusing on um, local volcanism within Antarctica. So I'm going to talk about ice cores, blue ice sites, and local source volcanoes. Um, so Antarctica, which is shown in the satellite image here, is the world's highest, driest, and coldest continent. Um, most of Antarctica is covered by several thousand meters of ice with a thin veneer of fern and snow over the top. Um, the East Antarctic ice sheet, which is this part of Antarctica, has been stable since, a re since the Oligocene, at least the Oligocene, whereas West Antarctica, which is this part of Antarctica, has probably collapsed and reformed a number of times um, over the last many hundred thousand years. Um, the Antarctic ice holds a very detailed and high precision climate record. And so that is, uh oh, <laughs> close that window. Okay, check for solution. Close, what should I do? Yeah. Just close it, okay, huh? Check, okay. <laughs> so um, the Antarctic ice sheets hold a very wonderful climate record, which can be accessed through ice cores. And so this is one of the reasons we study the volcanic record in Antarctic ice. And then also, another important aspect of the West Antarctic ice sheet is that it's a marine-based ice sheet. And so in a climate, in a global warming, climate change scenario, the West Antarctic ice sheet is, is potentially an unstable ice sheet and could contribute significantly to global sea level. So these are the reasons for studying the volcanic record in Antarctic ice. Um, Another aspect of Antarctic tephra chronology is it provides us a really nice integrated record of explosive volcanism in Antarctica. And this is important because if you look at Antarctica, you can see that most of it's covered with snow and ice. So we have very few actual outcrops in Antarctica. So really the end glacial record gives us a lot of insight into Antarctic volcanism. Um, again, as I just mentioned, the volcanic record in the, in the ice cores is really important from a climate perspective. The research I'm going to be talking about today is built on many years of research by many people. And then the final thing I'd like to point out is that Antarctic heifer chronology is really, really challenging in some respects because of the lack of outcrop and the lack of samples. But in other respects, it's quite simple because a lot of the tephra is in a non-silicate material. So we can find these really tiny cryptotephra, such as Jill, the ones that Jill mentioned this morning. Okay, so um, the things I'm going to talk about today are source volcanoes, blue ice, and ice core tephra. And the first thing I'm going to be talking about is source volcanoes. So this is what a lot of Antarctica looks like, very flat and white. Um, but in this slide, you can see this feature here, which is a volcano that's, that protrudes up through the 2,000-meter-thick um, ice sheet locally. And this is another one of these volcanoes. This is called Mount Berlin. It's a beautiful stratovolcano located in West Antarctica. Um, these West Antarctic volcanoes were first seen by Admiral Byrd when he flew over West Antarctica in the 1930s and 1940s. But they weren't really visited by people in a significant way until the 80s and 90s. Um, and at that time, Bill McIntosh and Phil Kyle and a number of other people initiated a program of mapping and sampling on these West Antarctic volcanoes. And, um, and were able, part, of the, part of the reason for doing this was to look at ice sheet history. But at the same time, they were able to sample explosive eruptions near the source. But as you can see from looking at this volcano, the sampling opportunities are quite limited. So you can see, you know, here's a little outcrop here, and there's some outcrops around the caldera rim. But a lot of these volcanoes are really completely obscured by ice. So Berlin, the volcano I'm showing you here, is one of a family of four, or of a number of West Antarctic volcanoes, um, only a few of which are active. But Berlin has produced many um, explosive eruptions in the last several hundred thousand years. So it turns out to be one of the really important ash producers for the Antarctic um, tephra record. 
So to summarize the ash producing volcanoes, there are two in West Antarctica, Mount Berlin that I just showed you the picture of, and Mount Takahi nearby. There's also the famous Mount Erebus, which is an active, one of the, the most active volcano on the Antarctic continent. Mount Berlin is still thermally active and hasn't erupted for about 10,000 years. Takahi erupted about 8,000 years ago. And then there's a couple of East Antarctic volcanoes, which are also important, Mount Melbourne here and the Pleiades Volcanic Center. So these, these volcanoes are really the big, the big players in the Antarctic local tephra record. So, the next thing I'm going to move on to is blue ice tephra. And blue ice tephra is kind of an unusual thing for people that haven't really thought a lot about tephra records in Antarctica. Um, again, ice is this really wonderful medium for preserving tephra because it's a non-silicate material. So you can sample a tephra layer, and you can see a tephra layer here, this dark band going off into the horizon. And we're sampling it using a carbide blade chainsaw. And you can, you can saw out a piece of this ice, melt the ice, and what you have left is tephra. So it's really easy to get a nice, clean volcanic ash sample. How do these blue ice tephra form? The way they form is a volcano erupts explosively, produces an ash cloud, which then settles onto the surface of the ice sheet. And then um, as time goes forward, snow falls onto that ash, and it becomes incorporated into the deep Antarctic ice. Now, in some places around the continent, the, the ice flow is obstructed by a topographic boundary, such as this mountain in this cartoon. And the ice comes to the surface and is ablated away. And in that situation, you have these bands of volcanic ash in, exposed in the ice and stratigraphic section. And again, because probably a lot of people haven't really looked at a lot of these um, end glacial tephra, this is a piece of ice cut from a blue ice area. And this is a tephra layer here. And I don't know if you can see it with the lights on, but the ice underneath this tephra layer is very clean. And then here is the quite dramatic tephra layer. But then the ice over the tephra layer is somewhat cloudy. I don't know if people can see that or not. Um, and this is because the volcanic ash is mixed upward into overlying snow and so, and this is a very typical kind of volcanic ash layer. We rarely see ash below the base of the tephra layer. Although in some cases, there may be a fracture in the underlying fern and you get a little bit of ash that filters down into that fracture. But usually the base of the tephra layer is quite clean. Um, here is a nice example of a really big, thick and glacial tephra layer. And again, this is Mount Berlin, the volcano that I showed you a few minutes ago. And the tephra layer that we're looking at here is in a nearby blue ice site in the summit caldera of an extinct volcano. And it's really a phenomenal site because we have 40 ash layers at this site ranging in age from, from 500,000 years to 10,000 years. And we were talking a little bit about reference sections yesterday when we were in the field at Mount St. Helens. And this blue ice site really is our reference section to which the end glacial, the record in the ice cores can be tied. Um, although this tephra layer here is quite dramatic, thick and coarse, and some of the pumice in this tephra layer is almost three centimeters, centimeters in diameter. And a corollary to having this very coarse pumice is that we have big feldspar crystals that we can date very accurately using 4039, um, argon 4039. A lot of the tephra layers look more like this where they're just little indents in the ice surface, but there's tephra underneath that low, point, that low spot. And how do we sample these? We sample them again using the chainsaws. And I put this slide in just because it shows you how, the, it shows you the geometry, the dip of the tephra layer beneath the ice surface. And this is, that, this is the dip that is formed because the ice is being pushed up against a topographic obstruction. And um, these are beautiful tephra layers. So this is a backscattered electron image with a 100 micron scale bar. And you can see just we've, we've been looking at these shard structures all day today, but really nice examples of bubble wall shards, stretched vesicles. We do have some microphenocrysts in these. And interestingly, we've done some pretty careful experiments. Nels Iverson has, and, um, and you can talk to him about it at his poster, where we've broad beamed, like used a 20 micron beam, 
on microlytic shards versus non-microlytic shards, and we get very similar compositions in those two populations. So you don't always have to avoid microlites. Sometimes you can incorporate them into your whole analysis. And then another thing I'd like to point out here again is that, oh, I'm barely able to see them. Yeah, here. This is a feldspar crystal. Um, it's another one over here. So these ashes, unlike, or these tephra, unlike the tephra in ice cores, can be directly dated to provide us really nice, robust chronology. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to tephra in ice cores. And the, on this same map of Antarctica that I showed you a few minutes ago, a number of the ice cores that have good tephra records in them are shown in blue. The waste divide ice core that I'll be talking about later, the bird ice core, Seipel Dome, Taylor Dome. There's another one over here, Talos Dome, that's a good one, and a few of the deep cores in East Antarctica. All of these have nice volcanic records in them. So the, the point of studying the tephra in these ice cores is that it gives us chronological pinning points within the ice core to help refine ice core chronology or cross-check, I should say, ice core chronology. They also can provide us with very precise cross-correlations between different ice cores, allowing us to compare the climate records in the ice cores. And then finally, they give us, again, this nice integrated record of volcanism. Um, the downside of tephra in ice cores is they are tiny. So 20 microns is about the biggest particle we ever see, with a few exceptions. But you know, 10 to 20 microns is pretty much what we're working with. Um, people have been working on tephra in ice cores for many years, and I just have a, a quick summary of um, references of work that's been done. OK, so one question that's actually quite important, and, and in Jill's talk this morning, you know, she showed us that peat section and said you can't really see the tephra layers, but they're there. And, Ice cores have a little bit of the same problem, that it's not always possible to see these very tiny tephra layers in the ice. But our first pass for finding tephra layers in ice is visual identification. And when the core handlers are looking at the core, they can see volcanic ash layers. And actually, Christy showed one this morning. And you, you said, are they all like this? No, <laughs> they're not. In fact, that's the most dramatic tephra layer in an ice core, really, that I've ever seen. Um, and it's a very interesting one, too, that, that Nels can talk to you about. Um, another way of, look, of finding tephra layers in ice cores is a sulfate record, and this has actually not been very successful for us. And Andre mentioned this morning that for the big global eruptions, there's an offset between the sulfate and the tephra, so that's caused us some problems. And interestingly, the local tephra often don't have a sulfate signal associated with them. This is something we don't fully understand, but we think it may be some kind of microbial processing of the sulfur, which moves it into a vapor phase form, which makes it not analyzable. Question mark on that. Um, you can also search at depths of known eruptions. We've had medium success with that. But then two things that have really been helpful lately are an optical dust logger and the continuous melter record. And again, Jill mentioned the continuous melting that goes on, and, and Andre talked about this, where you can see particle spikes and we can focus on those. And then the optical dust logger is a tool that is lowered down the core that shoots a laser into the walls of the core and reflects light. And if you have a dust layer, you get a, you get a peak of reflected light. So, so I think we're now able to identify many tephra layers pretty successfully. Um, a few more pictures of what tephra layers in ice cores look like. These are pretty good examples. Here's one with a nice kind of undulatory base. Again, that mixing upward. Here's a really very discrete, fine tephra layer. And here's a tephra layer that, that, that is um, a little more diffuse, but still pretty visible, and also a, a bit of a different color, that kind of golden color, which we often see with these trachytic tephra layers. The, the cartoon of an ice core over here shows all the tephra layers that have been identified in the waste divide core, and there are a lot of them. Um, we've only begun to really um, get through the sampling process of these, but everything that's shown, everything that has a red dot beside it is a confirmed tephra layer. Um, we also find these debris layers, which are interesting, and I won't talk about them now, but can talk about them to other people if they're interested. We have a couple of nice phreatomagmatic tephra in this core, and then many unanalyzed tephra. So it's an incredibly rich record. Um, we, to sample, these fine ashes, the first thing we do is melt and filter the ice. And we filter the tephra onto a polycarbonate filter that Andre mentioned again this morning. We then subsample that tephra using double stick tape. We mount it in epoxy and polish it. We carry out microbeam analysis to determine the average composition of the glass fragments or the range of compositions in the case of heterogeneity, although we see a lot of homogeneous tephra in Antarctica. And the elements that we really pay a lot of attention to are iron, calcium, titanium, manganese, and magnesium. Um, 
We do some statistical matching using um, the method proposed by Perkins at all 1995, but I'd like to second what Andre said is that we just use this as an indicator. And then all our correlations we really make by comparing the data you know, visually rather than relying on the, statistical, on, the, on the similarity coefficient or statistical difference. And I'm going through this pretty quickly, but if you, um, Nels Iverson's poster has a lot more information about the sample prep methods. Um, this is one of our really beautiful tephra layers from the West Antarctic Ice Sheet Core. And again, you can see really nice volcanic shards. And this is an example of a not so beautiful tephra layer from the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. So the arrows are pointing to our few little mingy particles of glass that we have here. And, and I was interested when Jill was talking about this morning that if she has a single shard, she actually places some, some value on that. In Antarctica, we don't really have that luxury because unlike Ireland, where there's not volcanoes all over the place, in Antarctica there are. And so there's quite a bit of windblown volcanic material. And what we, do, what we use as a rule of thumb, which is totally arbitrary, is that if we have um, <coughs> six shards that have, that have the same or related compositions, we consider it a tephra layer. If it's less than six shards, we, we're a little um, more nervous about that. And, and again, the six is, a, is really an arbitrary number, but we do have quite a few layers that have you know, six to 10 shards that we consider a tephra layer in the ice. Um, and I'll just show one example of a nice correlation of a tephra layer between a dated source and a few different um, ice cores. There, Mount Takahe, there's a tephra layer from Mount Takahe, one of the ash producers. It was erupted at 8.2 thousand years with a large error by argon. This is being redated. Um, in the West Antarctic Ice Sheet core, this tephra layer is found. This is what it looks like. And based on the ice core chronology, it's 8.161 years before 1950. Um, in another core, the Sipel Dome core, with an independent chronology, it comes out at 8.166 years before 1950. And this is great because it agrees with the argon, and also it shows us that the two ice core chronologies are internally consistent between them. And, and you know, the the age based on the ice core chronology is similar to the argon age, although again, with the big error, it's a little hard to place too much value on that. Um, and then this tephra layer is also found in the bird core. And um, I know people have shown a number of these distribution diagrams today, and I'm gonna show one, but unlike the ones that people have shown earlier today that had hundreds of points, this is a distribution diagram based on four points. So. The source volcano is here. We find this tephra here, 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 and here. That's it. That's the kind of distribution we're working with. So, so again, kind of thinking about eruptive magnitude and full distribution is a little tricky when you just have these very few points where the tephra layers are exposed. Okay, now a few words about geochemistry. Um, this diagram shows the, the FeO content, the iron content of glass, and this is from our reference blue ice section, Mount Molten. These are organized in order of age with the youngest here and the oldest here. And this is an example, I think, where, where really detailed tephra work is giving us some insight into the evolution processes in a stratovolcano that we would really not, we would not be able to sample at this level of detail, really in, in a terrestrial, in a non-ice setting. So again, there are 40 tephra layers here, and the really interesting thing about this set of tephra layers, which range over 500,000 years, is we see this really consistent change in iron through time. So this volcano, and I, I expect that this is a partial melting of the progressive partial melting in the source region, although um, that's something that could use a little bit more work. But part of why I put this up is you can see that many of the tephra layers have very, sim just based on the iron, have very similar compositions. So ones that are erupted pretty close in time can be very chemically similar and a little bit tricky to tell apart. Um, so, Recently, we have started to do some work with Nick Pierce in adding trace elements to our chemical portfolio of things that we're collecting on these tephra. And this is something that I thought about doing 10 years ago, and at that point, the beam size was just too big. There was, you know, we couldn't analyze 10 to 20 micron shards, but with Nick's nice work, now we can get robust chemical data on these very tiny glass shards. So I'm just gonna show a few plots, and I apologize for not having the error bars on here, but I think we can, you can get the point without them. This is um, calcium and weight percent versus niobium. Calcium by E-probe, niobium by laser ablation ICPMS. <coughs> and each of the colors on here represents a distinct 
Mount Molten tephra layer. So the, things that, the thing I'd like to point out here, which I find quite interesting, is some of these tephra layers are quite easy to tell apart using niobium. So for instance, the green and the yellow are very distinct in terms of the niobium content. Calcium is identical, so you couldn't use the calcium to tell them apart. But then conversely, if you look at these two tephra layers, the yellow and the red, you'd be hard pressed to tell them apart using niobium, but the calcium is distinct. So I think major elements and trace elements really need to be considered as a package to, to get the most out of your geochemical signal in your tephra layers. And then I'd also like to point out this. These are two tephra layers. There's one that's a little bit darker purple, one that's a little bit lighter purple. And these are two that are erupted very close in time. They're indistinguishable based on either calcium and ni or niobium, but if you add barium into the equation, Many of these tephra layers really look the same in terms of barium, but the two pink ones are distinct in terms of barium. So, so you really have to consider you know, the biggest data set that you possibly can when you're trying to geochemically correlate these different layers. Um, there are still, I think, some problems, like Nick pointed out, in the trace element determinations. And this is a plot that shows yttrium by I ICPMS and SIMS. And the ICPMS data is in the red points, and the SIMS data, the ion probe data, is in the, the um, uncolored points. These are for the same samples, and, or, or at least a subset of the same samples. And the yttrium, there's a very consistent offset between the yttrium from the ICPMS and the yttrium from the SIMS. So we've got a little problem with data intercomparability, and I don't have a good idea about what is causing this, but I think it's something that we need to be aware of. But then other elements like barium, we get really nice overlap between the two data sets. Again, the red is ICPMS, and the uncolored points are SIMS. Um, here's, a, here's an example where um, the a combination of trace elements and major elements helped us answer a question and this is a question, we had a, a tephra layer here in the blue crosses, which is from Cypel Dome. We wanted to know what it correlated to, either as in the blue ice tephra sites or in the waste divide core. And you can see here we get a really nice correlation between the bit 160 in the red circles and the Cypel Dome layer in the blue triangle. So just an example of a nice correlation that we can make there, although the rest of these are kind of a mess. I mean, these. These are a number of ice core tephra that we just cannot tell apart using either cerium or calcium. So um, just to conclude, there's, a, there's been a lot of volcanism in the Antarctic continent over the past 500,000 years, and it really dominates the tephra record in Antarctic ice cores. Um, but they provide very, even though they're local tephra, they're not some of these big data eruptions that we would love to see, um, equatorial eruptions. They're still useful to provide time stratigraphic markers within the Antarctic ice sheets. The geochemical signature of many of these layers is distinct and can be used to find the source of the tephra layers, as well as allowing correlations to be made between source volcanoes, blue ice, and cores, and ideally make correlations that involve either argon ages from the volcanic source or from the blue ice. Major elements can be used for many correlations, but trace elements are really allowing us to resolve some correlations that we couldn't do with majors alone. Uh, again, the trace element analysis is challenging because of the fine grain size, and I feel like we're really kind of pushing the limits of the technique, but that it's working well. Um, most of the tephra layers we see in Antarctica are from local sources, Mount Berlin, Mount Taki, the Pleiades volcanoes. We also see some non-local tephra, and Andre talked a little bit about that this morning. And we're getting some nice correlations emerging between the deep ice cores and ice cores in East Antarctica, West Antarctica, and local eruptions, and this provides some nice, precise correlations between the cores. And thank you. <laughs>